Welcome and thank you for downloading this Tuda podcast. Next week, Japanese astronaut Chaki Mukai will come and give a lecture about her experiences, her uh, mission, and her plans for the future on the, the space program. She's been on the <laughs> she's been on the space shuttle twice. Uh, next week, Thursday, during a lunch in the auditorium. Uh, we have a, a lecture planned. Uh, you are all welcome and invited to come. I think it's a nice break during your study activities uh, in the library. So come and uh, join us if you think this is uh, interesting. Good luck with your lecture. Okay, so that sounds very interesting. Of course, you have plenty of time next week to go there. Um, today, I'm, um, I'm going to talk about the exam, and I'll do um, an example question. Um, but before I do that, there's one small topic, should only take five minutes, that I didn't get around to uh, explain to you. And that was basically um, all the way at the end of this lecture. Um, so last week, or last time, I talked about the flight envelope. Um, basically, all the combinations of air speeds um, and altitudes at which you can fly. And one thing I didn't um, quite explain yet is that if you look... Over here, there's a stall limit, and of course, minimum airspeed is the square root of weight over S, 2 over air density, and 1 over CL max. And this means that minimum airspeed depends on air density. And that's a bit annoying, because that would mean that if you, um, if you would be in, inside the cockpit, then... Basically, this would suggest that you would have to calculate at every altitude what is the minimum airspeed in order to be, to be able to fly safely and not cross that limit. Um, so that may seem like a problem, um, but it isn't actually, because the airspeed indicator already solves that problem. I just want to explain you how that works, um, and after that we'll do the um, exam practice. So... How does an um, airspeed indicator work? First of all, what are the basic instruments in, a, in an airplane? These are the basic six. So, on the upper left corner, you see the airspeed indicator. Then you have an indicator that shows you the attitude of the plane. So you can see in which way the nose is pointing, even though when there are clouds or whatever. There's an altimeter, which tells you how high you're flying. Um, a device which helps you to turn nicely, um, a compass telling you which direction you're going, and a vertical speed indicator that tells you how many feet per minute you're climbing or descending. Um, but three of these are actually linked to the pitot tube and the static port, um, including the airspeed indicator. Um, and the airspeed indicator like I said, is connected to the pitot tube and the static port. And I just took pictures of some random aircraft. But over here you see a pitot tube, and this thing basically measures total pressure. Now somewhere along the aircraft, um, you'd have to calculate this beforehand, but there is one nice spot where you can basically measure static pressure, so it's a little hole inside the plane. And if you measure these two, then, of course, from Bernoulli, you know total pressure minus static pressure is a half rho v squared. So this is what you can use, basically, to, to calculate, well, what is the actual airspeed of the plane. So how does that work? Um, basically, an airspeed indicator is a, is a little box 
in the box goes static pressure. Now the box is nicely sealed, so inside you have static pressure. Total pressure goes into uh, some kind of a membrane. And of course, this membrane can expand, and it depends on the pressure difference with the static pressure, how far it will expand. So, through some gears, the thing will move, and it will make this dial move to the left and the right. So basically, what you have is that the displacement of the needle is a measurement of total pressure minus static pressure, which is a half rho V squared. Um, now, basically speaking, there's a problem here, because this is what we measure, so this has some kind of a value. Um, but we have one equation here, and we have two unknowns, air density and air speed. So that means this, this problem cannot be solved. If I give you the value of total minus static pressure, then you can't solve the equation because you have two unknowns. Now, you can solve it if you make an assumption. So if you would assume that air density is air density at sea level, then suddenly you can solve the problem. But of course, this, which, which is true airspeed, is suddenly incorrect. As, lo as soon as you're at a different altitude with a different air density, and you make this assumption, then suddenly the result of this uh, mechanism is incorrect. So it will indicate the wrong speed, not the true airspeed. Um, so, if you assume this, and you say, okay, we use air density at sea level, then what you can say is, okay, then airspeed is not a true airspeed anymore, but this is what we call equivalent airspeed. So it's the airspeed which is equivalent to the one which you would get at sea level. Um, so there's a relation between the true airspeed and the equivalent airspeed through air density, and it simply follows from this relation. So this says that equivalent airspeed is true airspeed multiplied with a ratio of air densities. So as soon as you have a different air density, then equivalent airspeed will be different from the true airspeed. Um, the question is, is, is that now really a problem? Um, because it doesn't show the true airspeed. Um, and this, by the way, this effect is quite significant. So if you would measure airspeed at sea level, you'd get the correct result. However, at maybe 10 kilometers altitude, you will be 100% off with this airspeed indicator. So it's a really big mistake you're making. Um, now if you look at the equation for minimum airspeed, then of course this is true airspeed we're talking about. And we're working with the real air density. Now if we would express minimum airspeed in terms of minimum equivalent airspeed, then all we have to do is we have to take this transformation here. So minimum equivalent airspeed is the minimum true airspeed multiplied with that air density ratio. And if you do that, then this is what you end up with. So I basically multiply this with rho over rho zero. So that means these rows cancel out. And then this is the minimum equivalent airspeed. Now what's nice to see here is that the air density at sea level appears. So minimum equivalent airspeed is not a function of, um, of altitude. So that's nice, even though this thing gives us the wrong airspeed, it will always show you the minimum airspeed correctly. And that's a, that's a very nice effect. Um, now going back to the dial, then basically where this green line stops is when if you're at maximum weight, then that is where stall will occur. So that will always be the same speed. Um, if you deflect the flaps of the aircraft, you can fly a bit slower. Then you can use this, this white um, boundary, basically. 
So that's all very nice. Then maybe just to conclude it, how does that work then physically? Why does it work like this? It's very simple actually. Um, the wing itself feels this dynamic pressure, half rho v squared. I mean, that's where it gets its lift from. And since this mechanism is basically just measuring a half rho v squared, it will always indicate correctly when the wing will stall. So physically, it's just measuring what is happening outside the plane. Um, of course, if you would use this then for navigation, then you'd have to start making corrections. But all aircraft have this basic thing, which gives you basically the wrong airspeed. Um, one final comment. Of course, this, this equation from Bernoulli um, is only valid at low Mach numbers, so below Mach 0.3. I could tell you exactly the same story um, for high Mach numbers. Um, you'd get a much longer equation, but the whole story is the same. You assume sea level conditions, and then you get a different airspeed than true airspeed, and still stall is indicated correctly. Um, so that's, that's all I wanted to share with you what I didn't have time for so far. Um, now let's have a look at the exam. Which is over here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about practice questions. I give you a very short summary of what you've learned. Um, those are the main things you have to uh, understand. Then I will show you basically the steps you have to take to solve an exam question. Those will always be the same, no matter what kind of performance question I would ask. Um, then two practice questions. I don't know if I have time for both, but um, we'll see how that works out. And finally, before I, um, before I continue, over here, there's a, there's a propeller. You can play with the mechanism. Um, I know at the first lecture, I told you a bit about propellers and how these actually work. Um, that's difficult to understand just from a couple of sheets. So if you're interested, feel free to play with the thing uh, during the break. Um, so, summary. What you really have to know is this picture. This is something you can practice a few times. Um, basically all the forces on the aircraft and all the accelerations of the aircraft for the most general condition. Um, now this isn't difficult, but you do have to know what are all the angles exactly. So you have to know basically these definitions of alpha, theta, angles between which axis systems are they, and you have to know basic, basic things like, okay, lift, is perpendicular to weight, drag is parallel to the airspeed, I should say airspeed here, and weight points down. So this figure you should really know because this is the basic thing on which all the performance questions um, are based. So four forces, um, aerodynamics, propulsion, and the aircraft weight, and two accelerations, because we're just moving in a two-dimensional plane. Now, if you write out the equations of motion, then this is what you get. So, two equations of motions. So these are equations of motion. And one power equation. And the power equation simply follows from multiplying the equation of motion with airspeed. So the power equation tells us that if you have energy in excess, you can either use it to climb or to accelerate, and if you don't have enough energy, you will either go down or decelerate. So it's just a different way of writing, um, writing out what we like, but the important thing to notice is that this parameter here, phi sine of gamma, that's basically, since gamma is the angle with the horizon, then V sine of gamma is the rate of climb, 
And therefore, this second equation is interesting if you're interested in time. So how much time does it take to get to a certain altitude or how much time does it take when I go down? Um, whereas this first equation only contains gamma, so that equation is more interested if you're, um, if you're looking at, for example, how steep can I climb? So just the angle itself. So these are then the basic equations and with those we can solve all the performance problems so you can summarize them all in a performance diagram and there are two diagrams we can make one for a jet aircraft and one for a propeller and the reason that we make two diagrams is because the propulsion system behaves differently therefore you have different fuel flow of the engine and therefore you have some different performance results but what you see is several things you could calculate minimum speed maximum rate of climb, minimum rate of descent, endurance, staying in the air for as long as you can, climb angle, uh, descent angle, maximum range, so the distance you can fly with an aircraft, and the maximum speed. Um, and this picture looks more or less the same for a propeller aircraft, it's just that the things when you have to calculate, for example, uh, fuel flow, or when the power you have available is important there you get slightly different results than with the jet aircraft but you can see the same things again so endurance is always a lower speed than range uh, then you have maximum speed and minimum speed so these are the basic things you have to understand then before you start answering a question um, this, this could be the general approach to solve one um, First, you always have to de derive the general equations of motion for two-dimensional flight. Um, then you have to simplify them. So if you're in a, for example, simplification means if you have an engine failure and you have to glide down, then you know, for example, that the thrust of the aircraft is zero and the power available. So these are simplifications you make to make these general equations applicable to your problem. Then, typically you want to know at which CL, lift coefficient, you have to fly um, to, give, to get a maximum performance. And this can be a different thing like range or endurance, depends on what you're interested in. So lift coefficient is the first thing you calculate because that's directly related to angle of attack so it tells you about the aerodynamics now once you know lift coefficient you can calculate the airspeed at which you fly and basically once you know those you can calculate all the other parameters like uh, drag power uh, fuel flow you name it so these are the five steps you have to take um, when you try to solve a question um, so, then, I don't know if, if this is all clear so far, any questions? No? Then, I'm going to continue with one example question. And the example question is this one. So we have two test pilots of the faculty, they're flying in the Cessna Citation, in which you will fly as well at some point during the Bachelor. Um, and they're doing measurements in flight. And typical measurements you could do with an aircraft is you, maybe you'd like to calculate what is in fact the lift drag polar of the aircraft. So in this case, we have a lift drag polar. And for convenience, I've taken a parameter k in there, which is just 1 over pi ae. So cd0 plus kcl squared. Of course, we know the, the weight of the aircraft. You know how heavy it is when you buy it. You know what the passengers weigh and the fuel. So that's an easy thing you know up front of a flight test. And then in this case, we don't know yet what that factor K is in the lift drag polar. So that could be the objective of the flight. Um, what we also don't know is we basically don't know what the thrust is that the aircraft is generating. Um, 
So, these pilots, they do two tests. They do one at test point one, where they basically they close the throttle such that uh, basically the engine is in the idle position, which means it is on, but it's just not generating any thrust. So, thrust is zero. Um, pilots maintain an airspeed of 90 meters per second. They can just do that by adjusting the stick. So pull the nose up if you go too fast and push the nose down when you go too slow. Um, and they keep the airspeed at 90 meters per second. Um, and as a result, of course, since you don't have any thrust, the aircraft is going to descend with 6 meters per second. Now the second test point, they basically do the opposite. Instead of closing the throttle completely, they give full thrust. And by doing so, of course, the aircraft is going to climb. So they know they have full power, so maximum thrust. But they don't know yet how, how good these engines are. Now, again, they keep the airspeed at 90 meters per second, simply by adjusting the nose of the aircraft. Um, and as a result, of course, in the second case, um, rate of climb is 13 meters per second. And in addition, one thing is given, one assumption we make, is that since this is a jet, we assume that maximum thrust is independent of airspeed. So we don't know how much it is, but we do assume that it doesn't change with airspeed like you see on most pure jet engines. So this is what's given. Um, and then there are several questions and they guide you throughout the whole problem. So what it says, okay, for straight and symmetric flight, um, basically draw a clear free body diagram with all forces, um, angle of attack, all the relevant angles, airspeed vector, and one assumption that thrust acts along the flight path. So now this is um, not so difficult. This is something you could expect as a question. Of course, if I make a free body diagram, then we have the horizon. We may have some airspeed vector, angle gamma, the nose of the aircraft is a little bit higher, alpha, we have a pitch attitude, and the forces, they simply follow from the fact that lift must be perpendicular to the airspeed, drag must be parallel to the airspeed, weight points straight down, and the thrust vector, it becomes a bit of a mess. You could take a different color. But thrust acts along the flight path, so that's in the same direction as the airspeed. So this is all you have to do, and basically this, this just takes you a few seconds if you've already practiced it. Um, then you have to do the same thing, but you have to now draw a kinetic diagram. And basically, one, one thing that's important is that you always have to make separate diagrams, free body diagram and kinetic diagram. Don't combine them into one picture, because you then, then you don't know anymore what forces are and what accelerations are. OK, maybe in this example you know it already. But if you try to solve something more complicated later, then um, a lot of forces and accelerations can get very complicated. And then you really have to make two separate diagrams. So we do the same thing. Airspeed vector, horizon, gamma, angle of attack, pitch attitude. And then, of course, in the direction of flight, we might have an acceleration forward. And perpendicular to this, you always have an acceleration of V d gamma dt, 
but it's already given here that since we're making a straight flight, so in a straight line, then that flight path angle remains constant. So the change of gamma with time is equal to zero. So you can say, well, this acceleration is zero as well. Um, then, what you have to do is, you have to derive the equations of motion in the direction of airspeed and perpendicular to the airspeed. So let's, let's just do that. Sum the forces in the direction of airspeed. And there's one important statement here, that flight path angle, gamma, is small but non-zero. Now what does that mean? That means that cosine of gamma is approximately one, but the sine of gamma is definitely not equal to zero. Um, so sum, summing all the forces and the accelerations, so this is the, the mass of the aircraft. If we look at the acceleration and along flight, we have dv dt, right? So that's dv dt. That must be equal to all forces. So looking at the forces, lift is perpendicular to the airspeed, so that doesn't count here. We have thrust along the airspeed, drag in the opposite direction, um, and then there's a weight component, and of course, the weight is perpendicular to the horizon, so there's basically an angle gamma related to the weight. So the weight is pulling backwards along the airspeed vector with the sine of the flight path angle. So if you would take this portion of the weight and this one, not very good drawn, but over there you have weight sine of gamma. So this leaves us with thrust minus drag minus weight sine the flight path angle. Now you can do the same thing perpendicular to the airspeed. Again we have the mass. We must multiply it with the acceleration, but in this case that's as you can see, it's zero, the vertical acceleration, or perpendicular to the airspeed. Um, now we have to look at the forces. So perpendicular to the airspeed, we have the lift, and the only other force is a component of the aircraft weight. So we just had the sine, and now we have the cosine in, in the direction down. So that's lift minus weight cosine of gamma. Now, we know cosine of gamma is 1, so this leaves us with two equations of motion, first one being this, and the second one simply becomes lift is equal to weight. So these are the equations of motion we're going to use for this case. Is there a question? Um, yes, well, I didn't put it in the question, so it says here straight and symmetric, but you're right, in the, um, if you look at the test point, so in the next step we would say, hey, airspeed is 90, so the pilot is keeping it constant, so we're going to keep dv dt zero as well. So if you would have put that there, it would have been correct, and then we could say that's zero. Um, so, then the next question is for test point one, show that the lift coefficient equals 0.37, and show that the drag coefficient equals 0.026. Um, 026, yes. Um, so, What's nice here is that you already get the result. So if you're not sure how to solve it, you can still continue the question. Um, but of course, lift coefficient is fairly simple to calculate because lift is equal to weight, which is CL half rho V squared S. And 
we know then you can write out CL is actually weight over S, 2 over rho, 1 over V squared. And, well, these parameters are all given. So it's 55,000. Wing surface area is 30. You get 2 over the air density. It's flying at sea level conditions. And 1 over uh, 90 squared. And what you then get, if you work it out correctly, it's 0.37, and it's a lift coefficient, so it doesn't have units. Um, now, this is usually the way you should write it down. So write down the equation first, then stick in the numbers, and then the final result. If you do it this way and you make a mistake, then we can basically see what you've done wrong. If you skip a lot of steps and you just give a result, then, and if it's incorrect, then we don't know what happened and you don't get any points. Um, so always do it like this. First the equation, then the numbers, then the result. And, well, in this case you don't have units, but always write down the units as well. Now, the next question, of course, is what is actually the drag coefficient? Um, Um, yeah, yeah, that's typically speaking if you if it was asked, okay, please calculate maximum range Then the question will state, okay, you have to derive the equations from the equations of motion, for example, yeah um, Now the next step is the drag coefficient and that's not so easy because as you can see our equation of motion is a little bit more complicated. Um, so what we have is this thing. <coughs> minus the weight sine of gamma. Now a couple of things are given. Um, we know rate of descent is 6.3 meters per second. So, in other words, V times the sine of the flight path angle is minus 6.3, so because you're going down. Um, what we also know is that the thrust is equal to zero. So, if we take this first equation and we fill in, okay, thrust is equal to zero minus drag minus weight sine of gamma, then we have one small problem because this is given, not the sine of gamma. So if we take this equation, then it basically says minus drag over weight is the sine of the flight path angle. So if we just multiply it with airspeed, we get minus dv overweight is V sine of gamma and of course dV is basically the power required so minus the power required over the weight is V sine of the flight path angle. Now that's nice because we um, we know a lot of things now, we know what's V sine of gamma we know the weight, um, we don't know the power required yet so what you can find then is that minus power required divided by 55,000 is equal to minus 6.3. Um, and this will give you that the power required is 3, 4, 6, 500. Uh, joules per second. So again, always give the units you work with. Um, now we're nearly there because you you understand that power 
is related to drag multiplied with airspeed. Um, airspeed we already know. So from the power you can calculate the drag, and from the drag you can calculate the drag coefficient, and that's what we need to know. Um, now, I don't really have that much space left, so let me just continue here. And of course, on the exam you should do it a bit neater than I do. So, we know power required is drag multiplied with airspeed, which is CD over CL times the weight, follows from lift is equal to weight, multiplied with airspeed, and that's nice because CL we know, we know the weight, we know the airspeed, we know the power required, so we can say 3, 4, 6, 500 is equal to CD divided by 0.37 times 55,000 times 90, which was the airspeed, so, if you do it correctly, you find CD is in fact 0.026. Um, so, are there any questions about this? Is that clear? There are some questions there. Sorry? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you can find gamma in that way. That's true. Yeah. Um, let me let me state here. I mean, this this is a solution. Um, there are many other solutions. You could also find sine of gamma, and then work with the first equation, and from there calculate drag. Um, there are many ways. They all give you the right result doesn't really matter which way you take um, as long as you take the appropriate steps. But you're right, if you would have then taken thrust minus drag minus weight sine gamma, you would have calculated gamma, you could have obtained CD as well. Yeah. Um, so, we know the drag coefficient, um, and one of the objectives of the flight was to calculate this lift drag polar. So. This was basically given, but the pilots didn't know K yet, but they did know what the zero lift drag coefficient was. So we know now CD, we've just calculated it, and we know CL. So we can say that's 0 0.02 plus K times 0.37 squared. Now this is simple, then of course you can obtain K, which is equal to 0 0.044. Um, so this is actually you might, something you might do in a test flight later during the bachelor. You might do a series of test points with a citation and calculate the lift drag polar based on these types of relations. What you wouldn't know then yet is this one. So you'd have to perform a lot more test points to figure out what is CD0 as well. Um, but now we know what the lift drag polar is. So next question is, okay, we've used test point one to calculate the lift drag polar, and now in test point two, where the pilots gave full power, um, we want to figure out how much thrust does the engine actually generate. So how much thrust does it create? So, we, n we have to know what is maximum thrust, and the answer is already given, it's 12 kilonewtons, you just have to prove that that is the case. Um, what's also given is that the rate of climb, which is V sine of gamma, is 13.3 meters per second. Okay, now, we have this relation, thrust minus drag minus weight sine gamma is equal to zero. Um, I'm going to multiply that 
with the airspeed because then I can use again I could also use your trick and figure out what is gamma first um, so you can say well power available minus power required minus weight V sine gamma is equal to zero um, and that's nice because we're basically we're at the same airspeed as in the previous test point we're also at the same uh, lift coefficient because lift is equal to weight in both both conditions so the power required which is basically depending on the drag coefficient which comes from the lift coefficient that will simply remain the same so the power required is still that value that we've just calculated so we we had it before it's three four six five hundred kilojoules per second aircraft weight is this the rate of climb phi sine of gamma is 13.3 and that must be equal to zero so from this you can calculate that power available should be equal to 1087330000 joules per second so clearly you have more power available than required and that's why you're going to climb um, now power available is simply thrust multiplied with airspeed um, so we have 1087 equals to maximum thrust and we're flying at 90 meters per second so from this you should find that maximum thrust is 12 kilonewtons and that was given so you've done that right and you're happy to continue to the next question um, now that's all for this hour in the next hour I'll continue with the question calculated the maximum thrust that this aircraft can generate um, which is 12 kilonewtons so that's for both engines together um, and now the next question would be derive analytically from the equations of motion that CL over CD should be maximum to achieve maximum climb angle in steady flight so we've just basically done flight at 90 meters per second to figure out what are the aircraft parameters um, and now we're going to look at okay what what would actually be the best performance of the aircraft so we want to know what is gamma max and you have to derive it analytically from the equations of motion so let's let's start with the equations of motion first one being this and the second one being lift equal to weight now clearly we're interested in flight path angle gamma so we need this first equation and we have to prove that CL over CD should be maximal okay now if I take the first equation and I write sine of flight path angle is thrust minus drag over weight so the excess thrust so the force that I have in excess you can use it basically to create an angle um, now weight here is a constant so this basically says thrust minus drag divided by a constant so from this you see that in order to have gamma maximal we need thrust minus drag maximum now I don't know if you remember but it was already stated in the beginning of the question that thrust as a function of airspeed 
is constant. And drag, of course, looks something like this. So since, um, since we want t minus drag maximum, we need maximum thrust, of course, to have as much thrust as we can, minus drag maximum, which means, of course, the drag should be minimum. And that's basically this point in the diagram. Um, now, we're almost there. Um, the only thing is now we, need, we know drag should be minimum. So now we can use the second equation of motion, lift is equal to weight, to say, okay, drag is drag times lift over lift, which is drag divided by lift times the weight, which is CD over CL times the weight. So minimum drag means CD over CL should be minimum and therefore CL over CD should be maximum. Um, in order, of course, to have maximum flight path angle. Um, so we've basically proven what we should prove that CL over CD should be maximum. So this then is correct and we can continue. Of course, now we know this, we probably want to know what, what is in fact that angle you can achieve. Um, so next step is you have to derive that the lift coefficient equals this. So what we had was this, right? CD is CD zero plus K CL squared. So CL over CD should be maximum, which means if you want to find the maximum of a function, then you have to take the derivative to the variable in the function and equate it to zero. Now drag is a function of lift, so this whole ratio is a function of lift coefficient. So I simply take the derivative 2CL of this whole thing and I make it equal to zero. So if you do that, then what you get is this, CL times C, uh, the derivative of CD, which is D minus um, what you get then is the derivative of CL, which is one times CD divided by CD squared, and that's equal to zero. Now, this thing is never equal to zero, of course, so this then means that derivative of CD to CL equal to CD over CL. So that's just the top hand of the ratio. And if I work that out, well, from this top equation, you can see that derivative of CD to CL, that's 2K CL. So I get 2K CL equal to ZD0 plus KCL squared divided by CL. So if I multiply crosswise, then I find CD0 plus KCL squared is equal to 2KCL squared so that means CD0 is K times CL squared. So CL is then the square root of CD0 over K. So that's exactly what I wanted to find. So that's correct. Um, so this is a der derivation you should be able to do. You could also do it for other ratios. So you could also do, for example, 
CL to the power 3 or, or this one or whatever. There are many ratios. Other ones will follow in another year. So if you know this one derivation, you can solve it. Um, by the way, this is just one solution. Um, of course, at the end of the day, if this is aerodynamic drag as a function of airspeed, basically we're trying to find this point for minimum drag, because there the, you have the minimum. You could get to the same results in a completely different way if you just write out drag as a function of airspeed you take the derivative of drag to airspeed and say that's equal to zero. Then you get exactly the same result as what we're doing here. Um, it would just take you a bit more time, I think. Um, so many different ways are possible to get at the result. I'm just showing you one here. Um, so now we know what is the best lift coefficient to climb as steep as we can. Um, and then if you calculate the actual value and the corresponding airspeed to fly it, because then the pilot knows if I fly this quick, then I know what the actual, uh, that I will perform best. So we've just figured out this. And we know the values already. So that's simple, and you should get CL of 0.67. Now, lift is equal to weight, which is a CL half rho V squared S. So the airspeed for, for this particular lift coefficient is the square root of weight over S, 2 over rho, 1 over CL, and that's 55,000 over 30, 2 over the sea level conditions, and 1 over 0.67. And interestingly enough, what you find is that this is equal to 67 meters per second. So always, always give the units. So if you fly this fast, then you would get the maximum flight path angle. Um, so, finally, final question. So it's a pretty long question. Um, calculate the maximum climb angle of this aircraft at sea level and the corresponding rate of climb. Um, now that's... So we want to know gamma. And we always have to work with the equation of motion. And gamma is what we like to know. Now, of course, this is um, still working. Thrust um, is given, basically. This is maximum thrust, which is 12,000. Drag we can express it like this. And minus the weight, which is 55,000 times the sine of gamma. Okay? Um, now, CD and CL, we already know CL, which is 0.67. So therefore, we can also calculate CD because they're just related to each other, which is 0.02 plus 0.044 times 0.67 squared. And what you get is a CD of, well, I'm not sure what the value is, but if you write this out then, 12,000 minus 0.02 plus 0.044. So 
So this is CD. This is CL times the weight minus the weight sine of the angle. So there's only one variable unknown in the equation, which is the flight path angle. Um, so this will be the maximum flight path angle. And if you calculate it, you would find that's, well, 9.1 degrees. So always look at your result. If, for example, you would find that the aircraft is descending or you get some negative value, then you know for sure you've done something wrong because you've already seen the aircraft can climb. So always think about, does the angle make sense? If the aircraft would go up by 50 degrees, then something will be wrong. So always think about your results. Um, finally, also want to know what is the rate of climb that belongs to the angle. Now, rate of climb is just airspeed times the sine of the flight path angle. In the previous question, we've calculated the airspeed, 67, times the sine of 9.1 and then you would get 10.6 meters per second um, and this is actually um, interesting because this also shows us that the condition where you climb as steeply as you can is not the condition where you um, climb as fast as you can in time so rate of climb max is not the same condition as maximum angle. Um, and you can already see that from the start of the question, because at the start, at when you fly at 90 meters per second, you could actually fly 13 um, meters per second in terms of climb rate. So don't, don't confuse these two, because they're different values uh, or different things. So Basically, if you fly faster at 90 meters per second, then let's say this is 90, then at 67, you're actually climbing st more steeply, but since the, the total vector is smaller than 90 meters per second, in this case, the, the vertical component of the airspeed is actually larger than this vertical component. So these two should never be um, mixed. Um, so that's the um, whole question about climb and descent. Um, I don't know, are there any questions about this so far? Um, then I don't have that much time. Do you want me to solve another question about cruise flight? Or do you maybe want some information about the lectures that wasn't clear? Or do you want to go home? <laughs> well, you can go home, of course, if you like. Um, if there aren't any particular questions about a certain topic, then I'll just um, try to answer a next question. And this one is about cruise flight. Is there? Um, well, sea level conditions, right? Um, the only important factor is the air density, um, which is at sea level conditions 1.225. So you, in, very, in, in a real flight, you will always have to see what is the actual air density at the ground, um, see where you are. So in some cases, you will get those conditions at a higher altitude, it can also be the case that at some parts in the world you can fly over land where land is actually lower than sea level. So you, you can also fly there, but it's just a condition. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question. Um, so we have a Gulfstream 4, which is a kind of a business jet type aircraft. Um, pretty uh, heavy and big thing and the question is okay 
we have the engines and we have some kind of a relation for the fuel flow. So fuel flow depends on thrust. So for each newton of thrust, you will create a certain amount of fuel flow. And something that, that quite often causes some disturbance is this thing, that this thrust-specific fuel consumption is expressed as newtons per hour per newton. So um, I can't help it. This is the way you get it from the engine manufacturer. Um, but it just means that basically fuel flow is, is this newtons per hour per Basically, it's per hour of fuel flow you get. So, 0.69 uh, newtons of fuel per hour um, if you create one newton of thrust. And this, this newton here is, of course, a measure for the quantity of fuel. So in simple, uh, one kilogram of fuel gives us about 10 newtons of fuel. So we talk about newtons of fuel, a quantity, and newtons of thrust. And of course, if you have hours, you must be able to um, create seconds out of this, so you get 3600 seconds in an hour, but if you don't do such kind of um, unit conversions, then you get very weird results, of course, if you work with hours instead of seconds. So always think of your result, does it make sense or, or not? Now, what it says here that thrust specific fuel consumption, CT, is constant and independent of everything. So this is a constant factor. Um, so this, this is what's given. Um, in this case, I wouldn't do this on the exam, but in this case I, uh, I just gave you one question. What's the maximum specific range? Usually it would give you a couple more steps, but I didn't have time to write them all out. Um, so what is the maximum specific range of this aircraft when flying at 8 kilometers? So we talk about range um, and specific range is basically the distance in meters per newton of fuel that you can fly. So that's this parameter V over F that is what we call specific range. Um, so question is, what's the maximum specific range of the aircraft? Okay, so basically we're talking about range. So we're in cruise flight basically. And I would always give you this information but that means altitude and speed are constant. So from this we know lift is equal to weight and thrust is equal to drag. Of course if you would consider a whole cruise flight then at the end of the flight you would be much lighter than at the start. So something will change but of course, aircraft weight isn't really changing that much um, in, in time. So it takes a long time to burn fuel and to reduce weight. So in this lecture, we're just talking about specific range. So that's basically meters per newton. That's how efficient you can fly at one moment in time. Um, next year, I will give you a lecture about what is the actual range of the aircraft. So how far can you fly? And they have to take into account that weight is actually changing. But that's, of course, not for now. Um, 
but we want to maximize v over f. And it was already given that fuel flow is ct times t. So this thing must be maximum. Now, we already know as well that thrust is equal to drag. So this means V over CT times drag should be maximum. And since it was given that CT is constant, this means that drag divided by airspeed should be uh, minimal. Or V over D should be maximal, doesn't really matter. Um, so V over D, max. Um, now, of course, this is what we um, basically have to maximize. So if you take the general approach again, like I explained at the beginning of the lecture, we must find the angle of attack at which you can fly as efficient as possible to achieve this. So we have to find what would be a good speed um, an angle of attack of the aircraft to fly at. So we have to write out um, what this thing is. V over D. Now that's airspeed, of course, follows from the lift equation, which is weight over S, 2 over rho, 1 over CL. Drag, lift is equal to weight, so that's CD over CL times the weight. Um, so you could also say, well, if I combine everything, then this, this of course is the same as the square root of the squares. So if I combine the whole square root, then this is what I have. I have one weight term on the top hand, I have weight squared on the bottom, so that means I get one over weight, I get surface area, two over rho, and if I divide by CD squared over CL squared, it's the same as dividing, uh, multiplying with the opposite, so that's one over CL times CL squared over CD squared. So this is then square root 1 over weight S, 2 over rho, um, and then end up with CL over CD squared. Okay, um, so this is, this is nice um, in a sense that we already know a lot of parameters here. So this is basically 1 over the weight of the aircraft, the wing surface area, which was 88.3, 2 divided by the air density, so this is half of the sea level conditions, and this factor, CL over CD squared. So this, if you write it out, is 3.72 to the power minus 4 square root CL over CD squared. So before we can continue, see we're nearly there, um, all we have to do is we have to find this lift over drag ratio in order to solve the question. Um, so Fortunately, I have an em empty page, so CL over CD squared should be maximal. So the question is, what, what is then CL and CD? So if this thing should be maximized, then, of course, drag. of lift squared. So what I have to do is I have to take the derivative 2CL of this 
thing and say, well, that's equal to zero. Okay, now well, let's, let's do that. So you get CL times the derivative of CD squared, which is 2 times CD times CD over CL minus 1, which is the derivative of CL, times CD squared divided by CD to the power 4, which is equal to 0. Now, of course, this is not 0. So we know that 2 times CL times DCD DCL minus CD is equal to 0. So that means DCD DCL is a half CD over CL. Now, DCD derivative of CD to CL follows from this. So that's 2 times CL over pi AE. So that means I get 2 CL over pi AE equals a half times this CD equation divided by CL. So this basically says that 4 CL over squared over pi AE is equal to CD0 plus CL squared over pi AE. If I continue here, then CD0 is 3 CL squared over pi AE, which means CL is the square root of a third CD0 pi AE. So you could memorize that, that thing, one third CD0 pi AE, then you already know what you have to find. Um, but if you know the steps, then that's, that's not necessary, of course. Um, so, going back, this means that if you would calculate CL, then some values were given, uh, CD0, E, A. So, CL is then a third 0.015 pi 6. Point, I forgot what it was 36 times 0.67 so cl would then be 0.26 and cd follows from cl So that's 0 0.015 plus 0 0.26 squared divided by pi, 6.36, 0 0.67. So this would then be 0 0.02. So we know CD and we know CL. Now that's very nice because if you remember, that's all we needed to solve the equation. We just need CL and CD. So V over D is this thing. So that's 3.72 to the power minus 4. Now, I've just calculated CL and CD. So that's 0.26 divided by 0 0.02 squared and then V over D would be equal to this um, but now we want to know what is we're almost there we want to know what is V over F so V over F is V over CT times 
drag, and we've just calculated V over D. So that's basically this 9.48 to the minus third divided by CT, which is 0.69. But if you look back at the, uh, at the question, and 0.69 is per hour. So that's per 3600 seconds. Um, so we have to express it per second. And if you calculate this, then you would find approximately 50 meter per Newton of fuel. So this is basically the specific range of the aircraft. So basically what it says is with one kilogram of fuel, I can fly 500 meters. So this tells you what, what the specific range is and how far you could get if you know how much fuel you have on board. Um, so that's the, the whole thing. I don't know, uh, are there any questions? You want to have the previous slide, but besides that, if there aren't any questions, then I just want to wish you good luck and uh, I'll probably see you in the next year. Please visit our OpenCourseWare website for more information. See you at our next podcast.